Bibles this morning, the New Testament letter of 1 Corinthians and the 13th chapter. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And in just a moment, I'm going to read from verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, beginning with verse 1. I hope everyone um, is able to to find that. If you see anyone struggling, do um, approach them. Seek to to assist them. 1 Corinthians 13, chapter, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1. Let's read. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly. But then face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully. Even as I have been fully known. So now, faith, hope, and love abide. These three. But the greatest of these is love. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. This chapter is, I believe, one of the most familiar passages in Scripture. But it's not necessarily one of the best known. Does that make sense? It's one of the most familiar passages in Scripture, but not necessarily one of the best known. It's frequently frequently read or at least referenced at weddings. Excerpts are printed in greetings cards. It's artistically painted and framed or stenciled onto people's walls for home decoration. Even non-Christians, those who um, uh, could rightly even be described as unchurched, might be familiar with these words, or at least some of them. They have been quoted in literature, film, television, Prime Minister Tony Blair read the chapter at the funeral of Princess Diana. They've seen it somewhere. They've heard it somewhere. It has some note of familiarity to them. So they are familiar. But again, the question is, are they known? Not known in the sense of heard before, but known in the sense of understood. Not known in the sense of acknowledged but known in the sense of embraced, 
Not known in the sense of potential recognition, but known in the sense of personal realization. The context in which this chapter is set is an ongoing commentary by the Apostle Paul on the Corinthian church's use of spiritual gifts. In many cases, their abuse of spiritual gifts. They possess gifts, but some of them are not using them. They possess gifts, but they're wielding the gift that they possess as a weapon to denigrate brothers and sisters who do not possess the same gift. They possess gifts from God, but they are not using these gifts within the boundaries that God has set, thus leading to a church of chaos and confusion, not characterized by the love of this chapter, but characterized by the self-serving showmanship of spiritual narcissists. Christians are blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. And beyond the spiritual blessings that we have, we know that every good and perfect gift comes from above, raining down upon us from the Father of lights who shines down upon us with undeserved favor. He's given so fully and freely of Himself in Jesus Christ. And in the Holy Spirit, He has given us and will continue to give us all the gifts, both of communication and of care, that we need to glorify Him in building up the church and seeking the good of our neighbors. The question is... Not do we as followers of Jesus Christ possess gifts. The question is, do we practice our gifts? It's important that we not only possess, but that we we practice the gifts and that we do so in obedience to biblical principles under the Lordship of Christ. Second Timothy chapter one, verse six says, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God given to you by the laying on of hands. Romans chapter 12, verse 6 says, Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. In other words, God does not provide gifts for us. He does not bless us with gifts for those gifts to be neglected, for them to burn out, for them to be placed on the shelf collecting dust. But He gives us gifts to be fanned into flame. He gives us gifts to be exercised, to be used. And the gifts that He has given to us vary. They vary from person to person. Dare I say, they vary from church to church as different congregations may excel in different things. And yet God gives His people gifts and He gives them to be used. But I would say that it is possible to both possess gifts and to practice your gifts and to still be desperately sick as a member of the church. And indeed, uh, uh, being a member of the church that's desperately sick, a, a part of one body to have a sickly effect on the body of Jesus Christ and thereby to be an unhealthy church. Ultimately, if you possess gifts and are practicing them, it counts for nothing if you do not do so within biblical parameters. Those parameters, uh, should be clear, are not meant to imprison. So, for example, uh, in uh, uh, the flats and houses of people with young children, they will sometimes put up gates along the stairs, will they not? Are they doing that to imprison their child? Charles thinks yes, actually, definitely. 
Are we doing that to imprison our child? Are, okay, are we doing it to, <laughs> to unfairly or abusively imprison our child? Absolutely not. We're trying to protect them because if, if we don't, they may take a tumble. And if they take a, 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 a tumble, they might hurt themselves very badly. So we're protecting them by putting up that, that barrier. God protects his children by putting up barriers and parameters not to divide us, but to protect us, to keep us safe. These parameters are meant not to imprison, but actually to empower. Not to negatively prohibit so much as positively to protect. These biblical parameters are summed up at the conclusion of the chapter that we just read. Faith, hope, and love. Faith, what we believe. Hope, why we believe it. Love, how we believe it. And how we show that we believe it. And those things, what, what we believe, this, this, this whole counsel of God, this eternal truth, is alone what we proclaim. And the hope that it gives us is that, uh, that, that, that keeps us going, that keeps us believing, that keeps us trusting. And the love that we have is the outflow of that. Remember that the right questions are not inward focused, but upward. Does this glorify God? And outward, does this build up the church and does it help my neighbor? Does it love my neighbor? Is it for my neighbor's good? And Paul here says that the greatest of the three things there is love. And so asking these questions, does this glorify God? Does this build up the church? Is this to my neighbor's good? is preparing us to love one another well. You cannot genuinely and meaningfully ask these questions from a cold, distant, dispassionate heart. You cannot ask the questions, does this glorify God? Does this to my neighbor's good? Does this build the church with an unsearching mind? You cannot ask the question with bland, milk toast speech. You cannot ask this question and, 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 and seek out the answer through glazed over, bored, senseless eyes. Only a person ablaze with love can ask these questions. Does this glorify God? Is this to my neighbor's good? Does this edify, instruct, build up the church? And so it is from love that we ask these questions. And it is to love that the answer to these questions point us. In the text, we see something about the power of love. Not the love of uh, we really should define this love, shouldn't we? Um, not the love of sexual attraction, not the love of romance, not even the love of appreciation of beauty, value or worth. The Greeks generally referred to this kind of love as eros. It is a love that is primarily about my feelings. And while Eros love is very powerful indeed. There is a greater love. Indeed, a love that is capable of reigning in and controlling the passion of lovers and lusters. The love to which he directs us is, is, is not the love of friendly companionship. The Greeks often refer to this kind of love as phileo. It is a love that is primarily about our friendship. And while it is uh, very noble and it presents us with the lost art of making and keeping friends, there is a stronger love still. It is a love that brings us closer, closer than friends, closer even than brothers and sisters. 
a love that transcends the, bar- the barriers and boundaries of what might be normal human friendships. The love that he speaks of is not even the love of natural affection. Sorge, the Greeks called this. It was that natural feeling and compassionate obligation that a person has for their parents, for their siblings, for their children, or some other loved one. That, that just natural, innate sense that this person is in some way maybe my responsibility, or maybe not that they're my responsibility, but we are kinsmen. We are related. We are in, in some way connected biologically. And so my, my, my soul is drawn to that person as someone that I, I care about. There's someone that I love. Why? Because they're family. This loving inclination could be said to focus on the family. And while this is a love that's most natural and even instinctive, there is a love that rises above even our resi- the residual blessings of our broken human nature and points us to what we were made to be like. Not the love of my feelings, not the love of our friendship, not the love of the family, but the love of God's faithfulness. The word he uses here is a different word altogether. It is agape. It puts uh, other people's feelings before my own. Agape, love. Friends come and go over subjective likes and dislikes, but this kind of love sticks around even when its objects are intensely dislikable and do not have any perceivable value or worth. Agape love is, uh, you know, it transcends even the instincts of family. The instinct that draws a person to a family member may be aggressively disrupted. And in some cases, that, that familial affection you have for someone may be irreparably destroyed. Perhaps by the unfaithfulness of a spouse or the rebellion of a child. But this love... Agape love is faithful even when we are faithless. It is redemptive, reconciliatory, restorative even when we run away. It is the highest and noblest expression of human affection. But it is not man as he is, rather it is Man as he was meant to be. This is a love that is from God. A love that is like God. And it treats, it treats the object as though it is something infinitely precious and worth sacrifice. And the clincher is that it's treated that way even when most would say the object of it is rubbish. And sacrifice would be wasted on it. This is the love of God for us. The substantial, sincere, selfless, sacrificial, successful, sovereign love of Jesus Christ for us in giving himself for us on the cross that we might be saved. This is the kind of love Paul is talking about that should shape how we worship Christ. How we walk as Christians. In other words, back to what he's already said about being imitators of God earlier in this letter. This kind of love we see is 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 a a love that is so powerful and, and, and so strong that without it, Other things don't have meaning. This love gives meaning 
to our music. Because he says, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, this love, agape love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. You know, it would be very annoying if I took this and, uh, uh, you know, just, just sort of start, you know, randomly doing that. It's quite unnerving after a while. It has to, to be a part of something else, right? It has to be accompanying the song. It has to be um, in, in, in tune with the, the music and according to the beat and the, the tempo of the song, which is why I don't play that. <laughs> the, 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 the problem is when we lack this kind of love, he, he, he tells the church at Corinth, it doesn't matter what sorts of tongues you're speaking in. I could care less if you don't have love. Some people want to, to uh, be, a, 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 you know, getting into all of this and argue about whether, you know, tongues is, um, is a human language or an angelic language on the basis of this passage. And that's actually missing the point of the text. Uh, Paul is making a, 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 an argument and he's saying, you know, speak in the tongues of men, right? You could speak, it, speak in the tongues of angels for all I care. Some totally unknown language. Do angels even have, in the Bible, they're always speaking in a way where we understand. So I'm not sure exactly what these tongues of angels are. That's not the point. The point is you could speak in the tongues of men. You could even start introducing a bit of angelic language into the church. And it doesn't matter if you don't have love. And, it's, and that's why he goes on in chapter 14 to talk about the right and proper use of tongues. Uh, the, the implication is that if you are not doing it according to the directions of God, the, the dictates of Scripture, then you're actually not loving one another with your tongues. If you're just jabbering away Loudly, as part of a group of people, you know, yelling out and screaming out in tongues. God's not impressed with that, regardless of what the person on the stage is trying to amp you up into. Um, and, 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 and it's not helping your brother or sister. Because although it's creating an atmosphere, it's not one of edification and it's not one of worship because no one has a clue what's going on other than a bunch of noise. Love. Agape love gives meaning to our music. If we have love, we're more than noisy gongs and clanging cymbals. We are compositions to the glory of God. It gives purpose to our prophecy. If I have prophetic powers and flowing out of these prophetic powers, I, I, I understand all mysteries. And have all knowledge. That is, there's revelations and deep insight that, that people can't normally grasp. And if I have all faith, faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. So you can do all of this prophetic stuff and still actually not be a prophet. <coughs> and even the prophetic stuff is kind of pathetic because you don't have the love of God in what you're doing. But when you have love, speak away. When you have love, share your insights. Share your understanding. Share your knowledge. When you have love, don't just share it. Proclaim it. Speak it. Be, be, be speaking the truth with your neighbor. Be proclaiming the, the truth of Jesus Christ into the lives of people around you. With love. Love gives substance to our sacrifice. Verse 3, if I give away all I have, if I deliver up my body to be burned, take everything that I have, take my life from me. 
But you do that with hate, with anger, with resentment, with some other manner and motive than one of love. He says, I gain nothing. So what I'm saying means nothing or what I'm singing or what I'm praising or whatever those tongues represent. And they mean they mean nothing. My prophetic powers and abilities without love mean uh, mean I am nothing. And then I give up my very life and I give up my life allegedly for the cause of Christ. And I've done it without love. There's no gain in that. Only loss. Your body is burnt. You're dead. Where is your reward? You may be like those that he's said earlier have built, but they've built with wood, hay, and stubble, not gold, silver, and precious stones. You'll enter into the kingdom, but there's... There's no perks for being a martyr because you were not a martyr of the love of Christ. But you were motivated by your own pride and your own arrogance and your own hate and bigotry. That's why Peter would later write to, uh, to believers scattered across the uh, Roman Empire not to, to be suffering for crimes, but to, to suffer for Christ. It's good to suffer for Christ, but it's not, it's not if you've done something wrong. We see more than just stuff about the power of love. I hope you're, you're gaining a picture that love is very powerful indeed. This love is the most powerful of all loves. But we see something about the purity of love. Because this is agape love and it is from God and it is of God and it is about God and it points us to God. It bears the qualities of godliness. That is, it's pure. It's holy. It's pleasing. It's acceptable in every way. It's pure in manner. And so he says love is patient and kind. He also says, if you skip a little bit, it, it, it is not arrogant or rude. This purity of manner is about how we love. Can you just not wait anymore to see the changes you desire to see? Just giving an example. Do you presume with a sense of entitlement and rights to know exactly what your brother and sister needs or what they need to do. Remember, love is patient and it is not arrogant. Do you make assumptions and presumptions? Do you speak abusively, act abrasively, dump your brothers and sisters abruptly? Perhaps you're in the right at least as far as your principles are concerned. Perhaps your message at heart is correct. But the way you are communicating it is doing a disservice to the message by not letting the message speak on its own terms, by having to brazenly Bully your point across. You can be true without being a trump about it. You don't have to tear people down to build them up. Let God's word do that. Communicate the word of God. Please don't hear what I'm not saying. Sometimes people think that... um, you know, oh, we, we, we read this and we want, we want to, to make caveats, don't we? We, we want to, to find some, uh, some other things that, that we can uh, uh, 
say, uh, he's not talking about that. Um, I, I'm not saying we should be silent about things that matter. I am saying that we should be responsible in how we address those things. The answer is not to stop talking. It is not to stop acting altogether. It is to start talking and to start acting as we ought. I'm not saying that the word of God doesn't cut. That it does not contain some things that might be insinuated in this this very fragile culture as being unkind or rude. Because of the way people have so subjectively used the language and the words, they, they, they can insinuate that. The word of God, we are told, is sharper than any two-edged sword. But we have to examine ourselves. Is it God's word that we wield or is it ours? Are we saying what God said or are we embellishing it a bit? Are we being a bit extra about it? Are we wielding it rightly for God's glory or for our own ends? I'm not saying that our words should pander to the spirit of this age or that we should be shaped by the crashing waves of culture and the ever shifting sands of time. What is true must be discerned truly, though, and it must be delivered truthfully. All must be tested for consistency with Scripture, not tribal politics or personalities. Cling to what is good and throw away what is evil. I'm not saying that by striving to stick with the disciplines of Christian communication and behavior, you will avoid criticism to the contrary. That there won't ever be a time when someone says you're being unkind or you're being rude. Because read the Bible and you'll see that God's servants has, have often been accused of things that were actually at the end of the day unfair and persecuting of the body of Christ. What I am saying is that we should not seek or revel in a reputation of acerbic divisiveness, but we should check ourselves. Is the opposition we face demonic or disciplinary when someone tells us you're being unkind, you're being impatient, you're being rude, you're being arrogant? Is the applause we hear the blessed support of holy friends or the baying of hounds? calling out for more of our rotten meat. The things that we say and the things that we do matter. And the way we do them, especially. Love is pure in manner, but it's also pure in motive. Love does not envy or boast. We skipped over that bit, didn't we? It also says later, if you, you, you skip the other part, it does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. This is about why we love. If you are letting what you don't have get in the way of loving, you are envious. If you are letting what you do have and feel you've gotten without help, And without other people in in your life. And you think that the people around you should jolly well do the same without your assistance. And if they ask for help, they're just being ridiculous and needy. You You picked yourself up and they should do likewise. You're being boastful. Those are the, the, I'm not just drawing out ideas here. Those are things that were going on in the life of the Corinthian church. They had a major class problem. And I think our society has a major class problem. 
And I think that the church cannot afford to be silent on such issues because if we are, what's going on in society comes unchecked into the church. And people live how they want and they say what they want and they do what they want regardless of the consequences. If you are wrong, but you keep trying to force your square peg into a round hole of truth, or perhaps you are not right or wrong, but your opinion really isn't a big deal at the end of the day, and it's a trivial irrelevancy in the scheme of things, but you plow on ahead to the harm and detriment of your brothers and sisters, you're insisting on your own way instead of submitting to God's way. Are you easily frustrated by time, circumstance, people, plans, and so forth? Then you're irritable. Do you hold people's neediness against them? Or do you hold people's success against them? As can happen in a socioeconomically diverse church such as that in Corinth. Or perhaps you respond poorly to discipline either from the leadership or from your fellow members. The list goes on. You are resentful instead of restful in the good plans and purposes of God for your life. Are you loving to see what you can get out of people? Are you loving to see what what others can offer you? Are you loving maybe so people will applaud you or so that people will feel good about you or so maybe you so that you can feel good about yourself? These are important things to to work through. These are important areas in which you need to examine yourself and, and your own hearts and your own minds and your own approaches to life. Love is pure not only in in um, uh, manner, not only in motive, it's pure in morality. What does he say? It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but it rejoices with the truth. Love unequivocally acknowledges and affirms the existence of good and evil. It is a postmodern lie of our society that there is no such thing as good and evil, that it's all relative, that to say there is good and to say there is evil is intrinsically unloving to people because they think, lo- that they, they think what you call evil is actually good and you're not loving them because you're saying what they're doing is, is wrong. Eventually, even those people can be pressed only so far and they eventually find things that they themselves find to be evil and good because those, those aspects of our created nature continue in us. Love says there is good. Love says there is evil. Love clearly identifies them. And then those areas that have been grayed somewhat by human sinfulness, love does not shrug its shoulders and say, oh, it's a really murky issue. It's very difficult, very complex, very gray. But love speaks with precision and clarity to the point because we have the word of God, which is sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even the, uh, the, 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 to the bone and separating it from the marrow. You're, you, you ought to be able to say, even looking into those, those, those gray bits, This here is good. This here is evil. And identify those things with clarity. Love abhors what is evil. And it holds fast to what is good. Romans chapter 12 actually says, let love be genuine. And its immediate follow up to that is abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love stands up and joyfully speaks for righteousness. It defends the needy, the vulnerable, and the oppressed. It pleads the cause of those who have no voice, at least a voice that is heard 
It proactively does justice, loves kindness, and walks humbly with God. It calls out wrongdoing, speaks truth to the powerful and the weak alike, and delights in all that is good, right, and true. It seeks the peace of the city. It preaches true, lasting peace in the Savior. That's love. It is not an amoral thing, detached from morality. It is something that is intensely moral in every aspect. Surely, though, uh, powerful and pure though this love is, it eventually fades, doesn't it? It eventually burns out by cold unresponsiveness. Or perhaps it's snuffed out by, by cruel aggression. Read the text. On the contrary... Because this love is not of us, but it's of God. And it carries the traits of godliness. We are further assured not only of the power of love and the purity of love, but of the perseverance of love. Love bears all things. Love believes all things. Love hopes all things. Love endures all things. Love never ends As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. That is to say, good things must come to an end. And we're not told where. We're not told when. We're not told how. Some some people, when they look at this text, they're a a bit too bold, I think, in imposing on the text unsubstantiated claims about the gifts because they're, they're, they're they're not looking higher they're not transcending, you know, the, uh, the nature. Oh, we want to talk about the nature of the gifts and whether they cease and whether they continue. And, and they, they, they lose the beauty of the passage in um, their academic debates. He's, he's directing our eyes not to what we do, but to what God has done. Not to what we have, but to all that is in God. All that He gives to us, all that He, he provides for us. And His purpose is therein. Some people look at this and they're like, oh, he says they'll cease. And I think they've ceased. And some people are very clear that the sign gifts have ceased with the death of the apostles. I don't see that in this passage. They they refer to the sign gifts to start with. And the language of sign gifts is never used to distinguish these gifts from other gifts in Scripture. Also, these gifts were exercised by more than the apostles. Sometimes the implication is only the apostles did these things. Other people did these things as well. Actually, let's be technical. God did these things through other people. Indeed, for a few hundred years after the days of the apostles, these gifts were still being reported. And those that history calls the church fathers, men like Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, Clement, Tertullian, Origen, and so forth, reported these gifts. Albeit, they said, in pockets, here and there. And I think there's this, there is the sense, even in the New Testament, that what God might be doing in one place, He might not be doing in another, but in any case, wherever it's going on, the kingdom is advancing, the gospel is being proclaimed, and whatever is needed... To secure the salvation of the lost, God will do it. God will provide it. Some are similarly too bold in alleging that there is something wrong with the church where one, some, or none of these things are evident in their more spectacular sense. And I likewise think that's wrong. The insinuation is that if you are born again, you will speak in tongues. And a variety of tongues uh, even not in view in Scripture as I read it anyway. And I think that's nonsense. I think it directly contradicts the Bible. The Scripture is very clear that not everyone will have this gift. The church at Corinth was one of those churches that was saying everyone has to have it. And Paul saying no. In fact, quite the contrary. 
And even if everyone happens to have it, here's how you should exercise it. Something that I really don't see being done. The fact is that God gives what he pleases, as he pleases, to whom he pleases, when he pleases. But even if and when these things have passed or will pass or have passed in places, but not in other places for now or forever, one thing will remain. In fact, three things remain. The faith that we have, what we believe, the hope that we have, why we believe it, the love that we have, how we show what we believe. (coughs) These things abide, he says. And for all eternity, these things will abide forever and ever. And the greatest of these is love. Love is relentless. It will not give in. It will not give up. Love is inflexibly resolute. It is unquenchably aflame. And it will achieve all that it has designed to in the church by the word of Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit. God's love will endure to the end. And so we come to the final thing, and that is the perfection of love. Verse 9, for we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. Now we see in a mirror dimly. But then we see face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know fully as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide. These three. But the greatest of these is love. There are things in this life that you and I do not fully comprehend or understand. We are like children who one day will grow up and then see things and know things and understand things and feel things that we didn't previously. We don't know all that there is to know. Our insight is not as clear as it should be. We don't understand what we prophesy or even necessarily do we recognize when we prophesy or when another brother or sister prophesies. Sometimes until after the fact. But knowledge is given to us. And we gain insight. And we learn truth. And we realize meaning. And we're empowered to proclaim. And yet we realize how imperfect we are. How, part, how, how in part we experience these things. Partial, not in the sense of prejudice, but partial in the sense of it's just not whole yet. There's something not, not fully realized. But those days will be over. We will not know in part. We will just know. And revelation and realization of spiritual knowledge... will cease in the sense of this progressive, ongoing development. We won't prophesy in part, for the prophecies will finally, all of them, be fulfilled in every way. Immediate fulfillment. Historical fulfillment, messianic fulfillment, church ecclesiastical fulfillment, eschatological or the end times fulfillment. It will all have happened. We'll be, we'll be living in the after prophecy. In the eternity of beyond prophecy. All the biblical prophecy pointed to will be over except for eternity. And all that the local church prophecy spoke of, warned against, encouraged, prohibited and promoted, there won't be any need for it. Because we will be enveloped forever into a perfect realization 
and experience of the risen Christ. Now the Apostle says it's like we're, we're looking in polished metal. You know, our mirrors are made of glass and they have crystal clear image. That wasn't what theirs was like. Consider checking yourself out in a spoon and you might, you might get some better idea of what they had to work with. <clears throat> now we, we see things as though we view ourselves in a glass. Uh, in, in, a, in a mirror, in polished metal. We can make out the shapes. We can make out the features. But the precise details are still blurry. Then we'll see everything face to face in real life. It's not even, you know, HD TV full color. It's real, personal, up close. Face to face. And we'll know. Really. And personally. We will see Jesus. We who have been known by Jesus. Will finally really and truly know him. And we're told elsewhere by the Apostle John. We will be like him. For we will see him as he is. Love will have accomplished All of its work in us, its powerful work, its pure work, its persevering work, its perfecting work. Now, we do not love perfectly. If you're if you're looking at this as a tick list and and you're saying, oh, I'm failing. My love is not like that. No one in this room has a love like this in themselves because this is God's love. And we can aspire for it and we can desire it and we can reach out for it and we can seek to emulate it and imitate it and apply it so far as we can, but we fall short. We don't love perfectly now, but God does. And one day we shall love perfectly, even as we have been loved perfectly by God. It is love that will get us there. John Chrysostom, another church father, spoke of this passage and he talked about how this love makes the timid brave, bolder even than lions when they think about it. That this love takes the fierce and the abusive and it makes them moderate. This love takes those who are wanton with lust and it makes them chaste. It changes us. And so while we are not as we shall be, if we have experienced and are experiencing this love, we are not what we were. The one body and the many members using graciously appointed and assigned gifts is called the church. And the church is built on faith and the church is united in hope, but it is expressed in the greatest of the three. Love, as we share with one another, as any has need of the bounty with which God has blessed us, as we seek to glorify God in doing good to our neighbors and building up one another. So can I encourage you to give yourself to the love of God and to the love of the community of believers so that they may be strengthened and stirred up to love. So that your neighbors may be loved. So that God may be loved. And indeed receive the honor, the glory, the adoration due to Him. For His love to us as we follow Christ our Lord. Amen.